Jesus' mighty name. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. You may be seated. We live? Uh, well, thank you all for joining us and um, appreciate so much you being with us, those of you who are watching live or will be watching uh, this message. I want to present some principles, first of all, that, um, of course, are for all nations, not just for the United States. And um, how God deals with nations is, of course, of critical importance. Now, the Bible itself is God's revelation. He gave us Holy Spirit inspiring it, causing it to be inerrant, preserving it so that today when I hold in my hand a Bible or 70 of them, <laughs> I know that what I'm reading is what God wants me to have access to. The Bible's not exhaustive. It doesn't tell us everything about everything, but whatever it tells us about, it's 100% true. Amen. It's true when it was written, and it's true now, and it's applicable when it was written, and it's applicable now. Amen. Even if there are aspects of it which passed away, what passed away was a shadow explaining what has come. And so every word of the scriptures has power. They speak to us. The book of Ecclesiastes, for example. It's a collection of wisdom about things under the sun. When the preacher Solomon talks about under the sun, he speaks about reality from a point of view and a perspective which is under the sun. But in doing so, it is an inspiration of the Holy Spirit to speak to us when we filter through or we learn and listen and read what Holy Spirit wants us to read through his revelation of Ecclesiastes because the entire Bible is its commentary on itself. So when we read the whole Bible, we understand to read any portion of the Bible through the commentary of the whole Bible. So that's why you don't say, here's what I believe, and then find a verse to prove what you think. Say amen. <laughs> we don't proof text. And we don't take what God says and put it into our own mouths. The Word of God fits the Word of God because the Word of God is the mind of God. Now we have the graphe, that's the Greek word for writing, and every graphe, what was written, was what is inspired. So when I hold up the Bible, I'm holding up the graphe. Many people are like, this is the logos. No, that's the graphe. Jesus is the logos, and the logos is the mind of God. We don't have the mind of God. We have the mind of Christ because that's the revelation. The mind of God is beyond us. We'd have to be God to have the mind of God. God knows everything. We don't. I know it's a shocker. I'm going to let that settle into some of you. You're not God, and you don't know what God knows. And God is filled with mystery, and you cannot remove the mystery from God unless you're God. So the Bible's not exhaustive. It doesn't tell us everything about marriage, but whatever it tells us about marriage is absolutely true. Many of us were hoping God would say some more things about marriage because we think that would help us. When in reality, we're having trouble applying what God already said about marriage, which would probably lead to a much better situation. God doesn't tell us everything about money, but whatever God says about money is absolutely true. And certainly God doesn't tell us everything about government, but whatever God says about government is absolutely true. But God didn't give us a treatise in order to answer every question about every systematic and every thought and every idea and everything that people say when it comes to government because most people don't understand the separation between government and what we call politics because government and politics are not the same thing. Can you say amen? amen. So <clears throat> the Bible reveals God. When God does something, we say, oh, I knew that. I know who did that. <laughs> Because I know who the God of the Bible is, and I know how he does stuff. This is how God accomplishes things. Now, the way in which our forefathers communicated that was by the use of the word providence. Now, the word providence can be defined by philosophers and, the, you know, and other theorists in a way that's completely 
opposite of what the Bible means by providence. And I don't care what other philosophers say. You shouldn't either. You shouldn't be reading people who don't agree with God. It's just not your job to become an expert on evil. You should become someone who's a genius with what God says. Now, Ruth Ann doesn't allow me to watch the news anymore because I will give you a principle here that if you're not applying it in your own life, you need to. Because if I hear somebody say something that in agreement with the Word of God on the news, I yell at them. She said, it doesn't do any good. I said, it does me a lot of good because that means I am not allowing them to influence my thinking at all. Now, after I shot the seventh television with the shotgun blast, she said, no more news for you, so to speak. It's not my job to develop polemics. That's the opposite view. God doesn't need our defense. And there's a difference between feeling like you need to get in front of God to help him out and standing with God because you are in agreement with what he's doing now. Those are strategic positionings they need to understand. People who become crusaders and they're out there trying to figure out every conspiracy are wasting themselves a lot of emotional energy and time. And when they get done discovering everything they think they've discovered, they haven't helped God's purposes at all. Our job in spiritual warfare is to positively pursue the purposes of God, and we'll run into all the burgers that we need to deal with just by agreeing with God and representing his purposes in the earth. Can you say amen? amen? So God has always had people in the earth who represented his purposes. It was their job to represent God in his image and then do the things on the earth that God wanted done. This was true from Adam from the very beginning. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. We're, we're, we haven't done that yet, and there's a lot of globalists that don't want us to. But you know, Ruth Ann and I, you know, we, we drove through Wyoming, and we drove for miles and never saw anybody, but we just saw some cows in the distance. You know, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of room. And this lie of hell that this nation, of this globe is overpopulated is the work of hell. as a hellish word. So let me offend everybody here today because the easiest way to offend the modern mind is to say that you should have a lot of children. And see, all of you can see you're already coming up with arguments about that in your own mind because you have been conditioned by a lie that having a lot of children is a bad idea. But God never, I said God never had that thought. He's never had a thought in his life. And he's been alive a long time. God's never had a, one thought, nor does the Bible encourage anything other than this one concept that having a lot of kids is a good idea. No, I'm not trying to beat you up with guilt. And I'm not one of the pro-lifers who says if you haven't had all the children you can possibly have, you're not really pro-life. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use birth control. I'm not preaching against that. I, I'm, none of those things uh, are, they're not a part of my message, all right? But all I'm saying to you is if somebody has five or six or seven or 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 children, they're not wicked. They're more normal than we are with three boys. Now, we have many more children because we had several miscarriages, but we have three boys. James, our second child, was actually a twin, and we lost the twin, but we still have James. And we appreciate and value each one of them, and if you only have one, that doesn't mean that you have disobeyed God. I'm not trying to beat people up with guilt. I'm simply trying to strike a very strong chord in our minds about what the Bible says, because what the Bible says and what globalists want us to believe are two opposites, and we need to think like God thinks. Amen? Amen. And very often the enemies of God in the earth are having more children than God's people. <clears throat> and he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And you're like, well, a lot of that land out there in you know, Wyoming is not inhabitable. Have you ever been to Las Vegas? 
you know that Las Vegas is absolutely not inhabitable, but is now filled with people. Have you ever been to Dubai where they actually build islands so they could have places? You know what I'm saying is, you know, if you want to do something, the ingenuity, ingenuity and genius of humanity is amazing. And it's power to overcome limitations. Our problem is not overpopulation. It's a lie that hell has given us and Planned Parenthood has worked to insinuate into the thinking of modern Americans and the world. And trillions of dollars are being uh, spent by the globalists in order to limit population when God's commanded us to fill the earth. Amen. See, because they believe in a global limitation when we serve a God of abundance. I said we serve a God of abundance. I said we serve a God of abundance. The largest desert in the world, if you dig into the sand and get down below the substrata, you'll find the largest river in the world. You see, at any moment, the places that are of dead could become the places most alive. You understand what I'm saying? Two people understand what I'm saying. I hope that you are listening. But the graphe is the written word of God, and every word... Every writing, that's what it says, every time the stylist was applied to the writing material, God was breathing on that scripture. And so we know today when we hold a Bible that every word in it has meaning and Holy Spirit's choice of words is significant. I said Holy Spirit's choice of words is significant. The Bible has many words that are made up by Holy Spirit. In other words, he created words in order to communicate something, and these words were not a part of human language until he created them. Because in order to express the reality of spirit to the natural man, God uses all kinds of literary styles. He communicates very often in metaphors and similes. What he says is, what you're seeing here is like that. What's in the spirit is like that. What's in the spirit is like the wind. That's the, the two things that Jesus is comparing when he talks to Nicodemus is wind and water. Born of water, born of wind, pneuma. We say born of spirit, and it's nothing wrong with translating it born of spirit, but because what, what he's doing, he's comparing two natural things in order to explain two spiritual things. Born of wind, he said, that's why he said, you know, the, the spirit's like the wind, you know, you don't know where it came from and you don't know where it's going, but you know it's there by the sound thereof. Otherwise, you wouldn't know it was there. In other words, movement of air is subtle. Things of the spirit are just as subtle. But if you have the capacity to hear, say hear, hear. then you have a capacity to discern. So the written word, the graphe, reveals God so that when uh, we know God, we say, I knew who that is. Today, we worship the God of the Bible. So how do you know that? Because I have a Bible. And it's not a fetish I set on a shelf and hope it emits magic rays that penetrate my mind and turn me into a good believer. I read it. And when I read it, I read it to hear. Say hear. Because this is how we get trusting faith. By hearing. Now, I love seeing, and we have a house full of people who can see. And uh, the use of the word seer, I'm not going to get off on that subject. That's a whole, whole other conference on the, what a seer is, except to say that there aren't seers as a specific or distinct kind of prophet or distinct kind of person. People who see are people who have a dominant function in the way in which the revelation comes to them. But if, if all you did was see and you never heard, you would always be in error. Amen. So I don't have seer conferences because I know seers and understand seers, and what I teach seers to do is hear. Because seeing is easy. They already have that capacity. I don't mind that increasing, and I will be happy to show you how to see more clearly. But if you can't hear, 
whatever you see is going to end up being error because you need to hear as the filtering system understand what you're seeing. So it is really adverse to the kingdom to continue to teach people to see if these same people don't know how to hear. And it has caused a, a rapid development of an immature prophetic movement because we have people who don't know the word of God, grafe, who have the capacities to see things in the spirit and they don't have a clue what to do with them. So here what we do, we teach you to hear so that when you see, which we vastly celebrate and encourage and all this expressions, and I can't wait to see Bert painting. Most of you haven't met Bert and Mitzi who are with us here today, but Bert is a painter. I weep when I, he was talking about it. I mean, inside, I was like, God, I wanted to do that. <laughs> but I can't do it at all, okay? My grandkids can draw better than I can. Seriously. I try to do with photography what uh, he can do. And thank you, darling. I'm kind of having a menopausal moment myself up here, so. These hot flashes are knocking me down, you know. You ever have that problem, Rick? Yeah. I think more sex fixes everything. That's my thing, so. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, you can't believe I said that either, right? But anyway, Bert was explaining me some things uh, that he wants to paint, and as he was describing them, I could see them in the spirit. So he can see in the spirit, but... It's also Bert's ability to hear what causes him to know what to do with what he's seeing. And so we have a lot of people seeing without hearing who are preaching error. Amen. Just flat out witchcraft, false doctrine, astrology, new age. I mean, they're over here in, you know, flapping the wings of demons because they're seeing things in the spirit. They don't know what to do with it. That's why God gave us a Bible. Amen. Do you have a Bible? Because we need to learn to hear. It's the first thing we do is learn to honor the voice. That's why you teach your children to honor your voice so they'll learn to honor the voice of God. You say, well, how am I going to know if I'm hearing God? Because you've got a Bible. Because I'm preaching the Bible and apostolic didache lays the foundation for you to say, oh, I know God agrees with that or no, that's not God because God didn't say that. Can you say amen? amen? And so we have Grafe, then we also have Rhema. Gabriel announced Rhema to Mary. He said, every Rhema of God arrives with the power to make it happen, which was translated, all things are possible with God, for some reason. When Gabriel said, every Rhema of God arrives with the power to make it happen, she'd ask him the question, how am I going to be pregnant because I've never done what's necessary to be pregnant? And he said, every Rhema of God, when I say the word, that is a God word in real time. When I invest eternity into time, when, I, when God wants to do something, he says something. So when I say rhema of God, that rhema arrives with the dunamis power to make it come to pass. And that's why she said, well, may it happen to me according to your rhema. She took the rhema and she said, I receive it. She heard it. She believed it. She changed her behavior and her entire life. In fact, surrendered herself to it, knowing that this was the end of the life that she had previously lived. She paid the price of that moment and said, I will never turn back. I will become pregnant in a way that no one in this world will understand, except those who can hear because they read the Word of God. So Rhema is the sword of the Spirit. Is everybody listening? But Ramos never contradicts the Word of God, the Grafe. Now, once you have read the Grafe and you know how to receive the Rhema, then you can develop the Logos so that you can have the mind of God. You can think what God thinks. Now, there are limitations to that. And so Paul, as an apostle, says, I have weapons mighty through God. 
that I can tear down embedded of the strongholds that the enemy builds around embedded places of disobedience and that high thing that rises itself up against the knowledge of God or what God knows. So even when you read and you have rhema, you still need freedom. Freedom. Because from the moment, even before you're born, hell begins to work to embed things in your soul, then build a stronghold around it to protect them that will cause thoughts in your mind, not, instead of obeying Christ, they'll, they'll obey that embedded thing. And he said, I have, I have weapons mighty through God. They're not carnal. I'm not going to argue from a book of man's origin. I'm going to speak to you in two ways. I'm going to speak words that can set you free. I said, I'm going to speak words that can set you free. I said, I'm going to speak words that can set you free. Amen. And he said, and I'm going to tear down the strongholds and expose those embedded places. I'm going to jerk that stuff out of your soul by the roots. Amen. And I'm going to command your thoughts. That's not your brain. I'm going to command your thoughts to come into obedience to Christ and if there's some other things that don't, I'm going to deal with that too. In other words, I won't stop this process until your thoughts agree with God. Amen. Wow. And so we gain some things immediately. We develop some things through experience. And then we become mature in things because we continue to think like God thinks. Be transformed by the renewing of your spiritual mind. So you can prove something about what God wants, about what God's purpose, his will is. Good, acceptable, and ultimate. A process of being personally transformed to represent what God had already originally intended before the foundation of the world. For you, for ministries, and for nations. Can you say amen? amen. So as we approach our understanding of what God says about any nation... We must be people who have read the book so that we know how God, who God is and what he does, who have rhema and know what to do with it because we have a framework, a worldview, or a context in which to filter it, and we then have developed the logos, and this is the sense of eldership. Now, the word elder in the Bible, uh, of course, uses a word which means somebody that's older than you are. I'm 65. And uh, I'm increasingly frustrated with being able to honor my elders because I can't find anybody. <laughs> so fortunately, we have some people here that are older than 65 that I can honor you. But I don't honor you as an elder in the kingdom if you're not an elder in the kingdom. But I still honor you naturally as someone older than I am just because you're still alive. You know. No, 65 is not even old, right? Say amen. amen. 60s are your most productive decade. Amen. But an elder then is a word utilized in the same way apostle, apostolos means one thing, but when Jesus says it, it means something else. Ecclesia means one thing, but when Jesus says ecclesia, it means something else. Amen. Grace is a word that Plato gave a definition, and most evangelicals use Plato, who's a heathen, pagan, they use his definition, unmerited favor. And, you know, in the Bible, the word grace has nothing to do with unmerited favor. So quit using that definition because it's not true. That came from Plato, a pagan who never heard, who had no rhema, who lacks the logos. Just read the Bible, and the Bible tell you what grace is. The enabling capacity, a spiritually enabling capacity to do what God wants. Because modern people quote grace as if, like mercy. They're like, give me some grace. Well, I can't do that if I wanted to. I'm not your source of grace. I can give you mercy. Because mercy is time and opportunity to change. But grace comes from God and God alone. If we could get grace, we wouldn't need the cross. The cross. The cross. I said the cross of Jesus, his finished work is our source of grace. Activated, appropriated because of the power of the cross. Yeah. And so when a word is used in the scriptures, 
Holy Spirit gives it its meaning, and we need to hear what the Bible says, have the maturity capacity to deal with it through Rhema, and develop a mindset, a Logos mindset. And so when God, in the New Testament, uses the word elder, which can be bishop or a presbytery, or they're all the same thing, okay? It's the fivefold leaders who are the elders. And so when the word is used in that sense, the word means expertise and experience. That a person who has expertise in hearing, dealing with rhema, has developed a Logos mindset, also has experience in doing so. You know, the last thing you're supposed to do is get somebody saved and give them a ministry immediately. Duh. I'm like with, uh, what's the guy's name? My, my best hip-hop dude. Well, yeah, thank you, Kanye. I'm still learning to hip-hop. <laughs> I'm not doing so well, Kirk, I'm, but I'm working on it. You, there's no grace you can't give me. So you are. What about your mercy, though? I need to know about that right now, you know, because I'm not seeing a lot of mercy here about my dancing. Listen, if you give mercy, you shall obtain mercy. You may need it, so you better give me mercy on my dancing. You know. Of course, a white man can't dance anyway, so, you know, we all know that. But Kanye, I was like, praise God. I really believe he's born again, but I don't think he ought to have a ministry. Not because he doesn't have ability, because the guy's a genius in his own way, given his own limitations, but, I mean, he does have limitations that... God is going to heal, I believe. Amen. And I pray for him that God will bring healing to him. Amen. But what happened was he was then appropriated by evangelicals instead of being discipled by them. Right. And so what he needed was to continue with discipling. And it would be really hard for him to be hidden, understand, as Paul was, who remained hidden for a time and really never came into his apostolic until about 17 years after Jesus knocked him down on the ground and yelled at him because he needed not only expertise but experience. So the Bible places immense value, honor on those who can hear, deal with Rhema, and have developed a Logos mindset who are elders with expertise and experience. Moderns do not know how to honor elders. And I'm not talking about people older than you. I'm talking about people who have something to say that comes from someplace you've never been and a well of information you don't have and ability to filter and deal with revelation you've never experienced. You're like, well, it's our turn now. It's like, you know, it's your turn to make a big flop. We're the new breed. We're going to start everything all over again. That is so unbiblical, I can't even imagine that you would say those words. That is so much in agreement with the strategy of hell instead of the strategy of the kingdom that joins the hearts of fathers and children. Yeah. Why? So the children don't have to start all over again. Yeah. That's the whole point. And to begin something as a new breed when you don't have that expertise and you don't have that experience, and believe me, it becomes obvious very rapidly that you don't, yeah. is to do things the opposite of the way what the Bible says and what Raymond would, would reveal had it been filtered through what the Bible says and what Logos mindset would minst, it immediately recognize as rebellion. It's pretense. And pretense is, of course, a form of rebellion. It's a justification for doing what you're not supposed to do. And it's easy to find that justification. Well, the fathers are not doing what we think. I know that's because you're not in charge. You don't learn how to change the fathers. You learn how to submit to them. Amen. So what are they wrong? Then we'll just continue our errors. <coughs> that's wrong. Wrong answer. You haven't read your Bible. You haven't gotten the rhema, and you don't have the logos. So God places immense honor on those who have expertise and experience. And he says to us, 
learn to listen and learn to submit because God is not going to be represented by novices. Right. Right. See, how do you know that? Because I read the Bible. Yeah. He ain't going to do it. What are they, we're the new breed. God's doing a new thing. God's not changing his mind about anything. Amen. When God does a new thing, it's an old thing that he's starting to do again because he has some people willing to listen when they hear, develop an understanding about what to do with Rhema, and have a Logos mindset. It's new to you, but it ain't new to God. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? So he's doing a new thing. Yeah, he's doing a new thing in Israel. That's what that scripture said. Because he finally could prophesy that he was going to have a remnant again. When you have a remnant, you can start things over. Yeah. Amen. But you don't start over without elders. So Jesus began the development of his elders before in three years. But, it, you know, it was 15 years after the day of Pentecost before a non-Jew got born again. Why? Because they were still developing their eldership. I'm not saying God wanted that. What I'm saying is that Jesus understood this principle. And when they finally woke up, you know, and Simon Peter got a rhema that changed his logos, even though he could hear the Bible and quote it to God, in the trance, God said to me, don't say, don't call what I call clean, unclean, just because you, your culture and tradition told you to. You've been reading my book, but you don't understand it because you don't know how to filter it properly through rhema and you don't have my mindset. In other words, Jesus came to his generation and they had the Old Testament, but they didn't have the mind of God. Amen. And uh, Simon then, he misunderstood and he had to argue with God and then God had to fix him so that he would hear and finally uh, shocked as he was that God would be interested in saving someone who wasn't a Jew, yeah. I mean, he was like, hello, that's bad doctrine. I mean, that's the way he was thinking. <laughs> I mean, he was like a tulip, Cal you know, Calvinist. Those people were created to go to hell. I mean, you know, did you know a whole lot of people believe that God created some people to go to hell and other people go to heaven? I know that blows your mind, but there's still people that think that. John Calvin came up with that ridiculous idea in an exaggeration of the sovereignty of God. That's why people say God's in control, but he's not. God's in charge of the outcomes. So, <clears throat> what was I talking about? It was something great. Do you remember? Elders. Say elders. Yeah. They're not really rabbit trailing that much. Elders. So right now, when we understand from the Bible and Rhema and Logos how God deals with nations, we can hear a clear voice that represents God to hear what God says about America. Now, it's really fun to do interviews. The fact that COVID came and the whole world changed and everybody said immediately we need to go online. It's like, thank God for social media and now we're social media gurus, right? I mean, every, you know, there's still places here, right? I mean, I can throw a stone over here, and here's an empty building this morning on Sunday morning, and everybody's listening to somebody preach online. We're here together, and, um, well, nobody has on a mask. Thank God. And, um... <laughs> I didn't tell them they couldn't wear a mask. There's some of them I wish had on a mask. <laughs> some people I've seen, I wish they wear a mask all the time, you know what I mean? But, or at least a little more paint on the barn or something. Do something. <laughs> Maybe I'm the one that's ugly. But, um, But they're not having any service today, and so people are watching via whatever. Cell phone, iPads, and people have other kinds of phones besides those that are made by Apple. I'm so sorry. <laughs> May the Lord bless and keep you. You guys haven't heard any jokes about, I guess not. 
Just a tough congregation today. I don't, I don't think anybody appreciates my humor as much as I do. And so we've learned the, uh, you know, how to communicate over the internet. And uh, in doing so, we have, um, we've lost something of what we're attempting to communicate. Elders provide a voice for us of experience and expertise. And if I, as an elder, were to get an interview with God, see, we've all become expert at that. I've been interviewed by many people. I've spent time in my studio now being interviewed. And then I also preach to a camera and, you know, and I've been doing that a lot. I have, I have equipment here and then I have equipment at home in order to do that because that's how we're communicating right now. And so um, I've been interviewed and I've interviewed people. There's an excellent interview, uh, Clay Nash and I, about fathering that's available. And uh, I have a YouTube channel, by the way, which any one of you can come become a subscriber to just go on YouTube and look for Dr. Don Lynch. And, um, <clears throat> and so there's a lot of interviews available. I think it'd be awesome, you know, to uh, just um, set up, uh, you know, get my people with God's people <laughs> and uh, schedule God for an interview. And ask him, you know, what you do with an interview, then you usually people get a list of questions, and here's what I want to ask this uh, guest we're having, and you know something about the guest. There's usually a good reason why you're interviewing him or her, because there's something they have to say that's unique, and uh, there's something that uh, messaging that God's giving through them that you want others to hear or include and blend with your own. I think that's great. Uh, so if I were, uh, you know, if I had the capacity to um, set up an interview with God and say, uh, you know, to God's agent, I would like to interview God and see what he has to say about America. I think that'd be pretty, that'd be pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, we probably could, uh, it might even go viral. <laughs> we don't like that word anymore, right? But it, it might go viral if you could prove it was God, Right? Of course, God's already doing that because God's already spoken about who he is and how he deals with nations. And you can recognize God involved in history, what our forefathers called providence, which is the biblical definition of the word providence is basically based on the word provide. So it's based on the idea of the contrast between God and idols, animism being the vast majority of false religions are animistic because they think something other than something other than God is their source or provision. So when you say the God of the Bible is the one who is our source, then you're speaking of God involved in history, and uh, his involvement in history is about his provision. He's a provider, and he provides us with what we need, not just physically, but in every aspect of our lives. He's my source. Amen the authentic vine. I'm plugged into him, and if I'm not, I'm dead. So that's what providence means, simply God involved in history. Deists say God wound up, you know, created. They believe in a creator, but they said he just wound up the universe like a, like a clock, and he's and walked away, and he's just letting it run down on its own, so it's up to humans uh, to make history. Uh, but the Bible is clear. If you have a Bible, you know God is involved in history, and God hasn't left it up to humans to determine history because God is the blueprinter of history, and we are partnering with God in order to produce that blueprint, while others who hate God and are enemies of God are working to do something other than. Well, the other than is anything except providence. Are you with me? So we know how God operates in history. Now, I'll give you two or three important points. If I were to interview God and ask God today, what do you have to say about America? He would not answer any question that we ask him. Now, this is going to really help some of you because you waste a lot of your time trying to teach God <laughs> in your prayer life. Oh, Lord, you know. I'd like, yeah, I do. Now, it's all right for you to, uh, you know, to have an emotional moment with God 
and uh, tell God how frustrated you are or tell him how you feel. That's wonderful because that's a part of your relationship with God. God's very personal and uh, he's listening patiently because he already knows a lot more about how you feel than you do. But in fact, you're expressing how you feel with him as a good thing because God enjoys that kind of company. Now, I'd be careful about how I address God. And, uh, you know, because I've noticed the more experience I have with God that God doesn't respond as often to my daytimer as he does to his own. You know, this, well, I've scheduled some time to be with God. And God's, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> as if you're in charge of that. As if God runs the universe based on your daytimer. Well, your schedule. Your, people don't have daytimers anymore. Or whatever your phone tells you to do. Or your Apple Watch tells you. Breathe. <laughs> I've been breathing, stupid. Stand up. I, mean, I have an Apple Watch, and they tell me to stand up. I'm like, shut up. You're not in charge of my life. Right? That's so stupid. I don't think God feels that way about you saying, okay, God, I've got some time for you now. Fortunately, God is good at being able to multitask. <laughs> and when you approach God, he hears. We know that. But my point is, it's better to have a posture toward God is, Lord, when would you like to talk to me? Now, some of you, um, because of the life you live and the hard-hearted and hard-headedness of your life, likes to talk, talk to you mostly in dreams because it's the only time he can get your attention. <laughs> and if you get good at that by honoring revelation coming to you through your subconscious, God will develop your conscious mind and he can talk to you more often. But you have to learn how to honor God and honor his voice. As I've described, one of the first things you teach your children is to honor your voice. And most parents have frustration simply because they never taught their children that, and they work all day long trying to get their children's attention. And then that escalates into something that's not very beautiful. And by that time, the child's like, ah, I don't feel very loved. What's well, because you didn't teach them to honor your voice when you say to your child, as I do to my grandson, Mason, whatever Mason's doing, I expect Mason to stop doing it, come where I am, and listen to what Papa has to say. Well, I go, who do you think you are? I think I'm his papa. See, boy, you're a boo boo. No, that's exactly the way God designed the universe to operate. Hello, that's order. That's order. Quit listening to pagans. Quit listening to the world. Quit listening to the devil about how you need to rear your children. When God's already told you the way to rear your children, if they honor you, they're much more likely to learn how to honor God. And even if they don't, they'll still have something in them that will cause them to have something called character. So there's nothing wrong with teaching your children to say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Oh, you're so controlling. I said, I wish. I had three boys. I never didn't think there ever was a time when I felt like I was in control. Let me tell you that right now. I know how to deal with boys. Stop that! <laughs> now we have a granddaughter, and I'm lost. It's over. Forget it. <laughs> Whatever you want, darling. Here's the keys of the car. You two years old and driving them. Now, God giving us an interview, the first thing God's going to do is he will set the agenda and not us. See, when you interview God, he, God comes into the studio and uh, he, he's God. And by the time he gets there, the cherubim and seraphim have already come in and the fiery ones have already purified you and burnt you up to a crisp and you look like toast and then the glory people come in and you're on the floor because <laughs> they're sitting on you with the heaviness of glory and God comes in and sits down and you're on the floor going, <laughs> whatever you got for us. <laughs> Your list goes out the door, honey, when glory comes. You don't ask God questions. God gives you answers. And when he does, they have no, none of them had anything to do with your questions. You're all like, God, could you please answer my questions? God, like, could you shut up long enough for me to give you the right answers to the wrong questions you're asking? Forty days, Jesus revealed himself to the apostles to teach them the kingdom of God. It was not a church growth seminar. After 40 days, they said, are you going to give the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus was like, oh, brother. 
not for you to know, guys. Wrong question, no answers. In fact, Jesus said, Father, I didn't even ask the Father, and he didn't give me that answer either. I don't know. That's not what you need to know. You need to know something else. After 40 days with Jesus, the resurrected one, revealing himself as the resurrected one, the glorified man, they stuck him up with the wrong questions. We're good at it. Right? I mean, we're good at it. We, you know, first mistake, never ask God a question that has the word why in it. <laughs> right? Why? You have, you have children that did that, right? Remember when they went through that phase? Well, we're going to go to the store. Why? Well, we get some food. Why? Well, because we're going to eat it. Why? Because we don't eat our metabolism will collapse. Why? Because God created us that way. Why? Well, because he loves you and that's why you exist. Somewhere along the line, if you keep asking why, you get back to God, right? But our questions are not God's agenda. God's answers are his agenda. And so really be careful. I'm not saying you don't have the right to ask God for revelation. I don't say you, go, you don't have the right to ask God for a dream to answer questions or give you direction. I'm not saying that. We all, that's part of our training in the, in the prophetic. It helps us understand how to approach God and how to operate in revelatory things. I'm not saying that, but I am saying to you that when God does answer you, you still won't get the answer to your question. And then when God does what he said he'll do, after it's over, you'll say, well, I knew he was going to do it, but I didn't think he was going to do it like that. Right? Because God is God and we ain't. And what we're learning about God is that God is always focused on his own agenda. Because he's God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can get God to answer all those questions you have. Uh -uh. So you can prove what God wants. What? You can prove what God wants because you got a lot of things you want and you think everybody else wants and you think God wants and he doesn't want that at all. And until you have a transformed mind, you have no clue what God wants until your mind becomes more like the Logos of God. That makes sense? So we interview God and we ask him about America and God's not going to answer our questions. I'll tell you what God is going to say. And you're like, I wish you did have started here instead of that long introduction you just gave. Everybody said amen. amen. Well, it's time to leave. The introduction's not even over. <laughs> Three things God says about America. Number one, God always says something about his original intentions. If you ask God anything about your life, he'll always go back to the blueprint of your life. I don't, you ask God anything about your life, he's always going to go back to his original intentions. He's not going to talk to you about the way your mama, who you know, who your mama thinks you are, who you think you are, who anybody else thinks you are. He's going to talk to you about you as he thinks you are. And then when he does, he's going to reveal mystery about you because God knows more about you than you know about yourself. Because God is the one who had the original blueprint. He designed you, the Father did, then Jesus created you, then Jesus redeemed you, now Jesus is restoring you. Now, the same principle applies to nations. Deuteronomy tells us God is the one who divides the nations and sets their borders. So all these people who want a borderless world are antichrist in their agenda. Say amen. amen. Don't look at me so strange. God wants nations, and he wants them to have defined borders, and he doesn't want the whole world to be one big blob. That is not only unbiblical, but it's antichrist in its concepts. It is anti-mercy, anti-creation, anti-equality, anti-inalienable rights, and it's everything God never does because God always works through remnants. But back to the subject. God always begins to speak to us about original intention. Now, if you read history, don't ever read Wikipedia because it's Wikipedia. Whatever it actually is, you'll never find what it actually is in Wikipedia. you never find what it actually is in Google. In fact, if you do a Google search, the first 417,000 entries will be things you don't ever want to read. And who wants to go to the 418,000 section in order to find something? This world is now designed to deceive you. 
and to accomplish a systematic delusion on your mind that causes you to think of the past in a way that redefines the, the present in order to prophesy a false future. That's why you must break off of yourself the mold of the world, or it could be translated, do not allow the world to shape you in its mold, or don't mold yourself into the shape of the world's mold, because in doing so, you will never discover, you will never discover what God wants if you're listening to the spirit of the world. Because the very work of hell is, is, is it's anything but that. The anything but that method of hell is whatever God wants, I'm going to stop it. Even in its most minute details, hell is always working as the enemy of God and the enemy of God in terms of God's original intentions. Now, the Bible makes it clear that God has a strategy called remnants. God wants everybody, but it never starts with everybody. He starts with remnants, puts into the remnant what he wants everybody else to have. God wants all the nations, but he never starts with all the nations. God starts with remnant nations, and he puts into remnant nations what he wanted everybody else to have. What God did with the Americas was he took the unfinished purposes of the nations of Europe and Africa and Asia, Australia, other places on the earth, that had unfinished kingdom purposes, that it had generations of people who did not have a revelation of what God wanted, and he took that and remnants came to this land, both in the North and South America, and those remnant remnants that came to this land doesn't mean they were good people, bad people, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how you got here. Some came with greed, some came because of slavery, some came looking for a home, some came looking for opportunity, some came because they needed to get out of where they were. People came to this land for all kinds of reasons. None of those things affect God because God's not going to answer your question about that. Well, God's going to answer your question about what was my original intention. And among all the people who ended up here, you see, God sent some people. Hey! Hey! I said, God sent some people, yes. knowing that his remnant, no matter if you came here because of slavery, if you came here because of greed, if you came here just looking for a home, God knew his remnant would be what was necessary for your life to be transformed so you could discover his purpose for your own life and his intentions for this nation. Yes. Original intention. And if you're not hearing about that, then you're hearing something about the history of this nation that doesn't matter. I said it doesn't matter. Right. What's happening today is a rewrite of history to emphasize what God ignores. Amen. See, why did he ignore it? Because God forgives. Amen. I'm going to get in so much trouble here, but I haven't even been in this level of trouble before, and I've been trying so hard for years to get in this level of trouble. <laughs> I try to be an equal opportunity offender. And I keep failing. Some people are not offended. So today I want to make sure I get everybody offended to show what's in our hearts. The Bible is very clear. God forgives individual sins and God can forgive the sins of nations. How, do, how does God forgive the sins of individuals? Confess your sins and you'll be pardoned. Confess your faults one to another, you'll be healed. There's, see, there's aspects of this. Repentance is not confession. You can get really good at confession. Some people are. You get good at it because they intend to keep on sinning. Confession is about pardon, but repentance is about change. Repentance means I've had a revelation which I've heard, believed, and because of what I believe that's new information, new revelation to me, I now change my entire life to fit that. That's re repentance. Because repentance has fruit or behavioral shift. Say amen. amen. So does God forgive the sins of nations? Say yes. yes. How do we know? We have a Bible. Yeah. And I've been involved at least for 20 years, myself personally, in identification and re repentance. Understanding that God doesn't need every American citizen to repent before he can blot out the sins of a nation. Say, why? Because God's always looking at original intention, and the second thing God's looking at is the condition of the remnant. Yeah. See, how do you know that? Because the father of nations, called Abraham, had an encounter with God. God said, I have heard the sound of Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to go down and take care of that. 
oh, this is going to be fun. Let's watch how God deals with Sodom and Gomorrah so we know how God deals with nations because these were city-states or nations, independent nations. And they're called cities. The sense of that in this time of history was they were independent nations or city-states, states or governments within themselves. And God said this, I, I, how can I deal with Sodom and Gomorrah if I don't go talk to Abraham first, seeing Abraham is a father of nations? See, God is God. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah, that's what he wanted to do. See, what we're doing is we're proving his original intention. His original intention was Abraham calling you to be a father of nations. And you're, you're thinking, yeah, he's going to have a son, and out of his son is going to come 12 tribes. Out of 12 tribes is going to come Israel. He's going to have a nation and, and other nations because he had other children, and they became nations. And, and I know you have that understanding, but you have to understand as well what God said about Abraham as a father of nations was this. He's a remnant, and I'm not going to deal with Sodom and Gomorrah before I talk to Abraham. So the Bible tells us how God deals with nations. He talks to the remnant. So God's going to tell us about his original intentions for the United States of America to be the receiver of the inheritance of preserved and reserved purposes of, that were never been finished, of things in your belly as I look at you right now that came to you from other nations in Africa and Europe and Asia, and they came to you because God was looking for this moment in history when there would be a remnant in the Americas that there would be a people who could inherit these purposes and go back to nations and break them open with an iron rod that out of the clay pots in which were the deeds and, and the things preserved, you could break them open and begin to declare into those nations their purposes. Amen. So when God looks at America, he said, let me talk about the remnant. So I asked Dutch Sheets, he said, Don, everywhere I go for the last decade, 70 different places a year, every one of the 50 states, he said, everywhere I go, I find a remnant. They're like us, he said. They pray like us. They have the heart of God like us. They act like us. They're not big. He said, most of the time, they're not big. 50, 100, like kingdom centers usually are. Some could be larger. In Brazil, they're much larger. But in the United States, he said, that's about, about the size he said, but their remnant is here. Amen. Now, if you Google, you won't find them. You're not going to see them identified on any of the media outlets because they're completely unaware that they even exist. You cannot discover what God is doing by listening to the world. You can only discover what God is doing when you have access to the word, rhema, and logos, and because you're listening to apostolic voices, prophetic voices who are foundational, who have expertise and experience. That's why we can follow Dutch Sheets' leadership and others. But he is an example of someone that when he speaks, I understand what God's saying about America. Because God is always talking about the remnant. You see, what's so important about what we've been doing is not the fact we need to get bigger in terms of numbers. We could have 5,000 people here. I wouldn't change our DNA one bit. If there are 5,000 people, if there's a David's army of 10,000 here who are willing to pay the same price you paid in order to qualify to be a part of the remnant. So we're not talking about people getting to heaven here, right? You're listening carefully. This is not church growthism. I'm like, you know, what I got to do to get to heaven. This is not ticket to heaven punching time. This is who's going to represent Jesus time. Totally different thing, and that's ecclesia instead of kingdom. Everything we call church is actually kingdom. You don't get born again to enter the church. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. What it says is the ecclesia is a part of the kingdom. You come into the kingdom, and then you can be trained and matured and set into a place where you can function. But just because you're born again doesn't mean you're functional. You know, the head says walk and you crawl. Works, uh, the Lord says eat and you stick your thumb in your mouth, which is 90% of modern American church. 
immaturity, say amen, infantile, non-functional in terms of how to shift the cultures, non-functional in terms of the Great Commission, which is about discipling cultures, Mothetes, ethnos, doesn't say go into the, into the world and make disciples of all nations. That's a ridiculous error in translation that fits evangelicalism and some commentaries I did. It says disciple cultures, mathetes, ethnos. It can't mean something else because what he goes on to say is very clear. Said, so do we have an ecclesia? If we're not displacing the gates of hell, we don't have an ecclesia. Kind of simple, right? So the answer God gives when he talks about America is, let me tell you about original intention. Until you have a revelation of that, you don't know what's going on in America at all. And then God, secondly, looks at the radical representative remnant, and he says, here is the gauge, the metron, the canon of how I know I can function in this nation. God comes and he says, do I have a remnant that's got the expertise and experience in its leadership and enough mature worshipers and intercessors who can partner with me, who understand kingdom culture and have a lifestyle and behavior consistent with representing me, who seek first the kingdom and the king's right behaviors, then God says that to the extent I have a remnant, to the extent I can work on my original intentions. And then the third thing God will tell you in an interview is here's my strategy to get more of my original intentions fulfilled until we gain the momentum to reach the ultimate of my intentions for every nation on the earth. Now, of course, evangelicals say, well, Forget that, because we all know that can't happen until Jesus comes. Because they say we don't even have a kingdom because we don't have a king. You might not have a king. I got a king. And he's not going to be king of kings someday. He's king of kings right now, right here. And I'm serving the king in his kingdom right now. So if you have a doctrine that tells Jesus to stay in heaven while you're in charge, you need to change your doctrine. He got it clear. I'm going to have you to disciple nations, and I will be with you. And he uses that little word, low. It doesn't mean down. It means behold, and it is an imperative. It is, it is a charging word. Here's what it says. Get your stinking eyes open so you can see the reality that I'm right here involved in what you're doing. So how long are you going to help us? Until... What you're doing, here's what he said, literally, behold, I am with you always. And the sense of that in the Greek is, I am with you to do what you're doing, because if you're doing what I just said to do, I'm with you. He wasn't just with the apostles, because he makes it clear those apostles are not going to be here. He even prophesied Simon Peter's death, John 21. Lo, behold, I am with you. How long are you going to be? Until the end of the age. What's the age? Not the end of time. He said, at the end of the age, he said, I'm going to be with you while you're doing this until you, all the time that's available for you to do it comes to its ultimate. He said, I'm just, in other words, this is very clear. This is what I want you to do, and that's what I'm going to be doing, no matter what you're doing. But if you're doing that, I'm with you doing it, and we're going to do this together until it gets done. He said, well, you believe Jesus is coming back? 100% Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, Son of Man, glorified. He's coming back to this earth physically, physically with a glorified body to rule and reign. He's coming. You are not a resurrected body. Thank God. It's going to be a lot better than this. You are not glorified, and you're not going to become glorified until he comes. Then we shall be like him and have a glorified body. We don't have one right now. I noticed that when I got up this morning. I do not have a glorified body. I'm not one of these manifested sons guys who thinks he can create galaxies. Say amen. amen. And I ain't swimming with sharks. I can't even swim. <laughs> I notice these glorified sons, you know, or manifested sons are sick, can't walk, but for some reason they think that they are now the bride of Christ. What they mean by that is that Jesus is never coming because they are the bride of Christ. 
Stay away from this false doctrine and this book of Enoch mystery garbage. It's junk. It's junk science, junk prophecy. Stay away from it. Just say amen. It's all right. Don't be uncomfortable. We don't mind shooting wolves around here. I just shot a couple, and now it's loaded back up. See, <laughs> so how do you know? Because I have a Bible. Yes. And the Bible doesn't have the book of Enoch in it. So, well, there's a quote from it. whoopie doo da day I mean, the Bible quotes Nebuchadnezzar. That doesn't mean I need to look at the book of Nebuchadnezzar and figure out how to worship idols and drink the blood of the bullock so I can have strength and put some blood of the eagle in my wine so I can get wisdom. Right? right. My word. And so God, if we interview God, is going to talk about original intention, the condition of the remnant, and what his strategy is now to get more of that original intention restored so that it can reach its ultimate fulfillment. It does not matter to God the condition of this nation and its culture right now. If he has a remnant, he will never stop pursuing his original intention. No matter how dark it gets, wicked it gets, no matter how many people loot, burn, destroy, how many people vote in a way that gives us more murdered babies. It doesn't matter. The sin and wickedness of this nation, it's always been sinful and wicked. What God is looking at is the remnant. Amen. And he will forgive the sins of a nation when we repent. Amen. If my people, not everybody, if my people, Now, Dutch Sheets says, we have already done the identification of repentance. We are in that portion of the verse of Chronicles 7.14, in which Jesus says, I will heal their land. Amen. 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 So to me, if he asks, what does God say about America? God says, here's my original intention, get back to it. Amen. Understand it. And follow leaders who have revelation in terms of expertise and experience in that original intention. And stop following leaders who refuse to change. Amen. Secondly, God will say something about the remnant and his condition. So find out what it takes to be a part of that radical and representative remnant and make that the highest priority in your life so you can partner with God and be a part of that Gideon band. Amen. Number three, what God will say. Here's my strategy to restore and return to a greater fulfillment of those original intentions until we get on a pathway of, of spiritual momentum through awakening and new era reformation that will bring more of those purposes to ultimate fulfillment, knowing full well that that process will require the presence, physical presence of the king at some point, but knowing full well that we have a mandate from that king who is our king here and now. We have a mandate to represent him in a radical, radical means original, in a radical, remnant, representative way, we have a mandate from God that you are not doing the will of God if this is not what you're doing with your life. Amen. That's what God would say. Three things he wouldn't say, and then we can do whatever we're going to do next. Number one, God would never say, well, the kingdom spiritual, so never be involved in anything natural. Y'all get quiet at the wrong times. That's awkward. <laughs> you thinking about, is that like a new idea? If I said to you, God can heal, but he never heals anybody, what would you think about that? You'd say, that ain't right. Yeah, you know, if God doesn't demonstrate something in the natural, out of spiritual reality, then I don't believe the Bible. I believe what cessationists believe. You're like, I come to preach... You know, preach sight to the blind, but that means people who are spiritually blind will have their eyes open. Well, it does mean that, but guess what? It also means people who are physically blind will have their eyes open. Amen. Say amen loudly. Amen. Yeah, well, I'm kind of raise the dead, but that, that doesn't mean you're going to raise the dead. It means just people who are spiritually dead, you're going to raise. It does mean that people who are asleep, which means you're dead, in the spirit, if you're asleep, you're dead, awake out of sleep and rise, and Christ will give you light. It does mean that the spiritually dead will have life. 
also means that he'll resurrect the dead because of the prayers of faith when God's made up his mind he wants somebody to stay here longer. Amen. 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 He said, well, you know, God wants us to have a kingdom, but he doesn't want it to have any spatial impact. And spatial, we mean having to do with natural world. So it's like if, if I'm a part of the kingdom, I never have anything to do with my culture. Eh, eh, eh. That's the wrong answer because it's so obviously unbiblical. It's not what Jesus did, not what Jesus called us to do. And it's so obviously wrong to say that if God has a remnant in any nation, that remnant will have no influence on the politics, culture, economy of that nation. What a ridiculous conclusion to reach that we're just going to be some people hidden in the underground somewhere and all of us need to get a bag of beans in a cave. That's so unbiblical it makes me vomit. Just a little bit, you know, came up my mouth. But I swallowed it, it's all right. It is ridiculous to assume that the Bible teaches that God is so otherworldly that he's not involved in this world. He's never going to tell you it doesn't matter who you vote for. He's never going to tell you you can vote for anybody. If they kill, murder babies even after they're born, well, that's fine. Who cares? They can represent you because you, you vote for them. You're saying this person represents me. That's wicked and evil to empower people to do what God hates. Can you say Amen. You say, well, you know, can't vote for anybody perfect. I know Jesus is not here, and don't write his name in for president. <laughs> and don't stay home like the other 50 million evangelicals did the last time. See, that's the most obvious thing in the world. If good people start doing good, the nation would be different in an, a short period of time. It's like saying, you know, uh, I love God and I'm part of the kingdom, but my, I don't ever do anything for God with my money. That means you're disobedient, rebellious. What you mean by that is that everything in the kingdom is spiritual, so I can do whatever I want physically. So then I can commit fornication, be addicted to pornography. I can murder people and beat my wife. My wife beats me up every morning. In this ministry, if you find out you're beating your wife, we're going to take you out back with a ball bat and beat that much out of you. Almost said it out loud, right? Say, so would you do that? Do I look like I'm laughing? <laughs> Thank you, Judah man. It's always great having Judah. And it is wonderful to have Barbara back. My hero, Barbara. Not Rick, Barbara. <laughs> By the way, Amanda and uh, Will are on their way. Liam, Liam Melchizedek has been born, and so they're, they're going to come here. They are looking for a house uh, that they need to rent, and so... Um, be, they'll be back with us, but we need to, if you know of any place, let me know. There are several things that God would never say in the interview. He would never answer our questions. You say, well, which party should I vote for? He wouldn't tell you the answer, because if you don't already know that, it ain't going to do any good. Right. Yeah. So are you preaching politics? Absolutely. Yeah. So what are you going to do? I'm going to do everything in the world I can to stop Democrats from having any power in this nation. Yeah. You say, are you really happy with Republicans? No. But there's enough there of a remnant we could work with when the Democrats, all you have is people who want to kill babies, pervert marriage, become globalists, erase borders, and turn us into a socialist democracy. That's not the original intention of this nation. It doesn't have anything to do with what God's doing with the remnant. It won't give us any strategic motivation to continue doing that, to produce that original intention in order for it to reach its ultimate. It is an antichrist agenda adopted by a political party that needs to be stopped. And then greater influence needs to be brought to bear. If necessary, other political parties 
that do represent the interests of God in his original intention, if it becomes necessary, we'll do it. Amen. What God says about America is this, seeing his original intention and seeing his remnant and seeing his strategy for now, God says, mercy is your currency because I will save America. It will not be politics that saves America. It will not be Donald J. Trump who saves America. It won't be your vote that saves America. Those are things you do because you're a part of the remnant. It'll be the remnant that God uses to save America. And a great awakening is on its way, already beginning to manifest. A new era reformation has begun in which God will reclaim the definition of original intention and design of his ecclesia. And there will be a people in this nation and in Brazil and in Australia and in England perhaps there's a beginning signs there Singapore Italy other nations will rise up in the next decades to be fathering nations again God is not finished with this creation and he's not finished with America and he's given us an opportunity unlike any we have had since the birth of this nation I intend to be a part of that remnant. Amen. If it costs everything, I'm in. If it kills me, I'm in. But I intend that now, you say, well, I want something from my grandchildren. Honey, I do too, but I'm going to tell you right now, I want something now. Or you listen, I want something now. I want to shift now. And there's nothing that hell's throwing at us that causes me to sit back and say, oh, no, we better not raise our voice. This is a time to be heard as like any other time in the past. This is when Daniel said, I don't have to open my doors to the east toward Jerusalem to pray, but you better believe I'm going to do exactly the same things I've been doing representing my God. You cannot threaten me and shut me down by lion's dens. If you have that kind of whatever you want to call that, I told it the test of character the last time we worked together. If you have that in your gut, and if you have the ability to submit and obey the king by following his elders and selected remnant leaders, I can tell you there's a place for you in this battle. God's not leaving anybody out, but a lot of people are disqualifying themselves by putting pause on the priorities of God in the season when they should make those do or die principles of life. Father, we pray for the United States of America. We reach back into the heart of God for the original intentions, that this would be a fathering nation, prospering so that it can invest trillions of U.S. dollars in kingdom expansion, to preach the gospel here and to preach the gospel in the nations of the earth, to be a leader among nations, to be an economic leader, and to be a model and of freedom and liberty for all people, even at the cost of internal wars, and the fighting of external wars. What is necessary to preserve the open doors of opportunity for liberty for every person on the earth. We maintain that original intention. We declare that God is angry about abortion on demand. And we claim the next three seats on the Supreme Court of the United States that will be appointed by Donald J. Trump, passed by the Senate, and will be seated in a way that will cause us to begin a process of returning to original intentions of the Constitution itself. But more than that, the original intentions of God. Lord, we claim marriage, and we say marriage will be one man, one woman, just as from the beginning of creation. Lord, we stand for gender. Because gender means the image of God in man. 
and all that hell is doing to attack gender in the name and authority of Jesus, we declare that we oppose evolutionary progressivism and scientism as a religion. We declare that man is male, woman is female. God created them that way on purpose. Let the purpose be maintained in our culture and nation. Lord, we stand for private property because it is your economic principle, even the principles of capitalism, that through investment, hard work, and belief in the sovereignty and him as our providence, you're our source. You're our source. We do not look to government to solve our problems. Government is not our source. Even as you said, Jesus, do not look to them as the good doers, as the benefactors in government who will then become your source. It shall not be so with you in the kingdom. We look for the kingdom economy where we look to Jesus and no other. We look to God as our source who enables us. He strengthens our hands to work and gives us witty inventions. We stand for private property and its protection by government that you have given as your servant to be a terror to them that do evil. Lord, we stand today for America, for more than revival, for revolutionary revival. Revolutionary revival, upheavals. You told us 15 years ago we would come to a point of revival and riot. We are here. And you said in that season this revival will become revolutionary. It will become an awakening. This awakening will become a reformation. This reformation will then give America the opportunity for deep transformation. Lord, we stand with Brazil and Australia. Lord, we speak back to England and we say to her, Arise in your place. Let that lion roar again. Let the island be ablaze with light. We pray for Singapore, gateways into Asia and those places of darkness and tyranny of behemoth and Leviathan, of the millions of your people. The remnant that is so strong in China rising up. Yeah. Hear our prayers. You see the blood of martyrs crushed by that behemoth. Hear our cries and crush that tyranny yeah. under your feet. Yeah. And right, we say in this time of global crisis that there will be a global awakening. That around this world, the glory of God will be something of, that people know. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as waters cover the sea. Let your sound be released. Let your fire be released. And let your glory be manifest in remnant nations and in the remnants within those nations in this season. We all declare together, amen, so be it in the name and authority of Jesus. Amen. Do you receive this word? Amen.